<laughs> yeah, that's what I kept trying to tell myself. Okay, well. But then I found when I was looking for Oh, really? Because. And it was like, so how did it. Yes, I told Mark right in case they want to be on C-SPAN 14. Oh, that's it. But yes, the FPF, the Federal Protective Service. I thought the meeting was wonderful, the two and a half days. I uh, also have secured uh, 40 Seattle Sounders and Seattle Seahawks uh, practice jerseys uh, and equipment uh, that is being uh, sent through the embassy uh, for the kids in Flores. Oh, great. So, you know, Carlos had secured some yeah. jerseys from the uh, Steelers, I think. Hmm. So I called the Seahawks and said, hey, and they... Yeah, and pony so, up, guys. But, you know, they also own, the, the, the group also owns uh, the Sounders, uh, which is the professional soccer team, which is drawing yeah, 35 or 38,000 people. It's incredible. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, so that's very exciting. I think they have they have good organization. They make the team really well. Mm -hmm. Drew Carey is one of the owners of the Sounders, and he's just an amazing. I mean, he goes to all the games. Uh, we sat with him in Mexico, played China, and uh, uh, and he sat with Anna and told her everything about because she didn't know anything about soccer and you know, explained that you know, yeah. I mean, it was. You know, not just a wealthy star owner, but a, but a guy who's committed to the to the so. um, It's looking more and more like. Mm -hmm. I did. I am.
morning, everybody. A quorum being present of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs entitled Transnational Drug Enterprises Part Two. The United States Government Perspectives on the Threats to Global Stability and U.S. National Security will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements and without objection so ordered. And I understand that Representative Judy Chu is uh, joining us today on the Subcommittee and would like to welcome her participation. As such, I ask unanimous consent that Ms. Chu be allowed to participate in the hearing in accordance with Committee rules. She will be allowed to question the witnesses after all official members of the Subcommittee have had their turn. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the Subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record. Without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that written testimony from Mr. James Beaver from the United States Agency for International Development be submitted for the record. And without objection, that as well is so ordered. With that all aside, <laughs> again, good morning and thank all of you witnesses for joining us here today. We're continuing our oversight on national security and the threats from illicit global drug enterprises. In October, we held our first hearing with a panel of non-government experts who focus on disrupting and dismantling drug operations in Southwest Asia, Latin America, and West Africa. We heard then about the mounting evidence that the drug trade is closely tied to international criminal and terrorist organizations and poses a national security threat to the United States. Today, we welcome witnesses from the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Department of Defense, the State Department, and the Treasury Department to respond to the recommendations that emerged from our October hearing. We're pleased to have with us today the White House Director of National Drug Control Policy, Thank you. And the UN uh, Office on Drugs and Crimes estimates that the global proceeds from illicit drugs range from $100 billion to more than a trillion dollars per year. It's quite a range. The amount of money garnered by the drug trade puts enormous power in the hands of criminal actors who have every incentive to disrupt law enforcement, displace legitimate enterprise, and destabilize governments. The President's drug control budget requests for fiscal year 2011, that's now before Congress, it asks for $15.5 billion, of which $6 billion is slated for international support and interdiction. This includes funding for efforts to halt drug flows from abroad into the United States. One question we should address today is whether this overall amount is adequate. A second question is whether the amount targeted to international drug cartels and interdiction is sufficient to mitigate the national security threats emanating from the expanding global drug trade and associated criminal syndicates. Our last hearing highlighted a number of policy and strategy issues. In Afghanistan, the ever-changing and increasingly complex relations between the drug trade, the insurgency, and terrorism continue to challenge us. Our main counter-narcotics initiatives over the past nine years, eradication, interdiction, justice reform, and the promotion of alternative livelihoods continue to evolve. These programs are supposed to be interwoven with our counterinsurgency efforts, but a recent Inspector General report questions whether those efforts are actually integrated. The witnesses at our October hearing caution that no single kind of narcotics approach will work successfully since traffickers are quick to adapt. They also emphasize that regional, cultural, and economic differences across the country must be taken into account for any effort to succeed. The extreme violence we've seen in recent years along the Mexican border has exposed the tragic consequences of the drug trade as well as the acute threat these enterprises pose to our own nation and to our neighbors. The United States has long-standing counter-narcotics efforts in Latin America, including the multi-year, multi-billion dollar Plan Colombia, and the ongoing Merida Initiative in Mexico and Central America. While eradication has been an entrenched aspect of U.S. drug control policy in Latin America for many years, in part because it's been seen as cutting off drugs at their source, some witnesses told us that the forced crop eradication in the absence of real alternative livelihood programs was a doomed drug control policy. West Africa is fast becoming a preeminent international drug hub, and the threats from the region are still not fully understood. New transit routes where drugs travel from Latin America to West Africa and then to Europe represent lucrative opportunities for criminal enterprises. These organizations threaten stability in an area of the world that is already prone to violence and corruption, and where we are seeing the rise of terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. The United Nations Office of Drug Control estimated that close to $2 billion worth of cocaine passed through West Africa in 2007, which would make cocaine one of the largest exports of that region. Transnational drug enterprises did not evolve overnight and have shown remarkable flexibility, alliance building capacity, operational fluidity, and top-to-bottom organizational sophistication that many licit businesses would envy. 
The United States, working closely with our partners, must break the back of transnational drug enterprises and sever the drug terror nexus where the monetary proceeds from drug trafficking help fund terrorist organizations such as the FARC in Colombia, the Taliban in Afghanistan, and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. While it's not the focus of our hearing today, I want to note the importance of addressing the demand for drugs that comes from within our own borders. Until we are more successful at reducing demand and taking the profits out of drug trafficking, we will continue to face significant challenges in our international counter-narcotics efforts. With these sobering thoughts in mind, I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses who have been charged by the American people with the challenging task of dismantling international drug enterprises, stopping the flow of money to terrorists and criminal organizations, and protecting our national security. Uh, Mr. Flake, I welcome you to give your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you for calling this hearing. I appreciate the witnesses coming forward. We've heard from the private sector, nonprofit uh, witnesses before, as, as mentioned, and it's good to hear now from every uh, level of government, uh, both those who are targeting the uh, financial networks like we do at Treasury and, uh, and those who are looking at other efforts. Uh, I'll be interested to see how uh, targeting the heroin trade now will uh, impact uh, what we're doing with the surge in Afghanistan and, and how those uh, two uh, items intersect, uh, but also to see uh, how our your assessment of uh, what our international partners are doing, if uh, this has been a a good year and a good trend, or, or if, if we need some more help there. But anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, I look forward to the hearing. Thank you. Subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panel that's before us today. I'll give a brief introduction of each of you, uh, and then we'll start going from left to right on the testimony. Mr. Gil Kurlowski is the White House Director of National Drug Control Policy, a position he has held since May of 2009. In that capacity, he coordinates federal drug control programs and oversees implementation of the President's National Drug Control Strategy. Prior to this position, he served for nine years as Chief of Police in Seattle. Mr. Kurlikowski holds a BA and an MA from the University of South Florida. Ambassador David Johnson is the Assistant Secretary of State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. In that role, he coordinates with the President and Secretary of State the development of policies to combat crime and international narcotics. A career foreign service officer, Ambassador Johnson has also previously served as the Deputy Chief of Mission for the United States Embassy in London and as the Afghan Coordinator for the United States. He holds a BA from Emory University. Mr. Anthony Placido is an Assistant Administrator and Chief of Intelligence for the Drug Enforcement Administration. In that capacity, he serves as DEA's Senior Officer for the United States Intelligence Community and manages the agency's Intelligence Division and the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Fusion Center. Mr. Placido has served with the DEA since 1982 in a number of foreign and domestic posts. He holds a BS from Northeastern University and an MPA from Golden Gate University. Mr. Adam Zubin serves as the Director of the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control. In that capacity, he's responsible for overseeing the United States government's economic sanction programs which target international narcotics traffickers. He has held this position since 2006 and has also previously served as a senior advisor to the Undersecretary of the Treasury for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. A former Fulbright scholar, Mr. Zubin holds a BA from Harvard College and a JD from Harvard Law School. Good to see so many Massachusetts educated people on. We get Mr. William Wexler is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Counter Narcotics and Global Threats. In that capacity, he oversees the Department of Defense's counter narcotics and threat finance policies and operations. He has previously served, on, previously served on the staff of the National Security Council as Director for Transnational Threats and as Director for Global Issues and Multilateral Affairs. Mr. Wexler holds a BA from Cornell University and an MPA from Columbia University. I want to thank all of you for making time on your schedules to join us here today and share your substantial expertise. It's the policy of this subcommittee to swear you in before you testify today or have you affirm your obligation to tell the truth. So I ask you to please raise your right hands and stand. Do you solemnly swear to affirm the truth and tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I think you all know that your complete written remarks uh, by agreement are already going to be put on the hearing record. And I know that they were substantial. We appreciate them and they will be read. Uh, but I ask that you try to summarize those remarks in about five minutes, if you would. The lights reflect green while you're on the go time. When the minute to go, it'll turn to amber. Uh, and when your five minutes is up, it'll turn to red. The floor opens up, you drop down, and that's it. 
<laughs> we, that's, yeah. The ambassador says, fine with me, I get to get out of here. <laughs> Not so lucky. Um, we'll try to be as flexible as we can, but we do have five witnesses. We appreciate you trying to adhere as best you can to those time guidelines. Mr. Kurlikowski, we're pleased to hear from you. I'm going to have to ask you if you would. I, if the microphone's Sorry. on, it may are be we, that it's not pulled close enough. Are we doing now? That's great. All Thanks. right. Thank you. The Obama administration believes that a balanced drug control strategy includes comprehensive efforts to reduce our consumption of illicit drugs, as well as drug production, trafficking, and related violence at home and abroad. Consistent with this view, the President's fiscal year 2011 uh, national drug control budget proposal seeks over $2.3 billion to provide support to our international partners in carn and narcotics programs. And that's an increase of $20 million over the level for the last fiscal year. And although today's hearing focuses on transnational threats, it's important to note that the administration's strong commitment to reducing drug consumption at home. As a longtime police chief, I've seen up close the terrible impact that drugs have had on individuals, families, and communities. And the earlier we can intervene to get people help, the better. And that's why community-based prevention will be a focus of our uh, efforts. Drug use and its consequences affect different places in very different ways. And in fact, there is no single drug problem in this country, but a wide variety of drug problems. The drug issues in each community are closely tied to the makeup, the economy, the geography, and the culture of particular communities. We will be expanding and enhancing existing prevention efforts and working to ensure drug abuse treatment services are made more widely available. These efforts will include expanded work to address the abuse of pharmaceutical drugs, that is a problem of increasing concern within the United States. Let me turn to the serious nat transnational threat posed by drugs. In order to put the thrust of our efforts to combat transnational drug enterprises in context, it's essential to examine the manner in which these organizations function. They thrive in an environment of weak governmental institutions, insecurity, corruption, and limited legitimate economic opportunity. And their purposes are served by a culture of violence, intimidation, and impunity to create the perception that they are the governing body in the areas that they operate freely. A clear nexus has been established linking the revenue produced by illicit trafficking and their violent destabilizing activities. In light of this, government efforts against the international drug production and trafficking organizations typically include interdiction, dr direct organizational attack, and disruption of inputs to the traffickers' chain of production and distribution. In Colombia, we have witnessed an evolution from what many described as a nearly failed state during the 90s to today's situation in which the drug-funded terrorist organizations have been reduced in size and power. Additionally, security has returned to many parts of the nation and the government is taking an increasing responsibility for implementation of programs formerly dependent on United States assistance. I visited the Colum Columbia last September and I observed that it is a safer place than at any time in the last 20 years. They have also significantly improved their human rights record over the past 10 years there are still certainly problems, but this remains a priority for the United States government in working with Colombia. And the government is stepping up to take on more ownership of the counter drug programs. I met with the national police chief there, from eradication to alternative development to demand reduction. And in Mexico, President Calderon's government is engaged in, as we well know, a violent struggle to dismantle major criminal organizations. And at the same time, they are working to permanently reform and strengthen the democratic institutions of government. United States intelligence sharing, training, and the provision of equipment through the Merida Initiative and other regional programs have been invaluable to our strategic partnership with Mexico, the Caribbean, and the Central American nations. Additionally, United States cooperation with Mexico also includes expanding collaboration and exchanges on prevention, treatment, and innovative uh, criminal justice practices. The most recent example is the U.S.-Mexico Demand Reduction by National Conference, which ONDCP hosted last week here in Washington, D.C., uh, with many federal partners, including the hosted by the State Department. The conference brought together public policy leaders, researchers, program providers, and local uh, coalition organizers from both nations to address the science of addiction, the effective prevention, treatment, and recovery programs that we have here in the United States that can be outsourced. 
conference included with a joint declaration of drug demand reduction cooperation to include, among other things, the further implementation of best practices in the fields of prevention and treatment. Similarly, there is uh, much that we can do to address the drug threats attacking both the United States and Mexico. In June of 2009, Secretary Napolitano, Attorney General Holder, and I released the National Southwest Border Counter-Narcotic Strategy in New Mexico. And that strategy is a key component of our comprehensive national response to the threat along the border. The response includes cooperation with Mexico through the Merida Initiative. The Southwest Border Strategy also seeks to leverage information uh, sharing with state and local partners. And given the stop sign, I think I'll stop here so the floor doesn't open up. Thank you very much. We'll try to give you an opportunity to get wherever else you want to go in terms of questioning on that. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Flake, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity today to discuss an issue of great concern to me and to my colleagues at the Department of State, transnational drug enterprises and their associated illicit networks. Mr. Chairman, I'm grateful for your leadership and the awareness that today's hearing brings to this important national security issue. We believe that transnational drug enterprises directly threaten the security interests of the United States, as well as the health and safety of our fellow citizens. These criminal enterprises actively work to subvert the rule of law wherever they operate. They undercut democratic institution building and economic growth in developing countries. As you noted at the first part of this hearing, the large profits generated by the drug trade and the efforts to hide and launder them can distort economies and governing institutions even in developed states. Drug trafficking organizations are at their core business enterprises often closely linked to other transnational crime groups and regularly engaged in a broad range of illegal activities that affect American values, business, and our security and health. The Department shares this subcommittee's deep concern over links between international drug trafficking and terrorism. As the international community has clamped down on terrorism and pressured governments from financially supporting terrorist organizations, some groups have resorted to drug trafficking as a source of revenue. Much of the work my colleagues and I do at the State Department involves foreign assistance and cooperation programs to isolate, minimize, and neutralize transnational drug enterprises. Using bilateral, regional, and global initiatives and assistance programs, we seek to build the law enforcement capacity of foreign governments so they can confront these threats before they reach or impact on U.S. soil. We help them strike directly at these organizations by disrupting their operations, arresting and imprisoning their leaders, and seizing their assets. This can include destroying drug crops on the ground before they can enter the processing chain, particularly in areas where farmers have viable alternatives, as Mr. Mansfield pointed out in part one of this hearing. And in other cases, with our partners at the United States Agency for International Development, we provide substantial programs to help wean growers away from drug farming through alternative livelihood and economic development. Mr. Chairman, countering the power of transnational drug and crime re enterprises requires a global effort. It requires enormous strategic, political, operational, and financial coordination and commitment, and most importantly, it requires building and further developing good and capable governance capacity in the regions where transnational drug enterprises operate. Thank you for your invitation this morning. I look forward to addressing any questions you have, in particular, any questions you might have about the programs and initiatives that my bureau operates around the world. Thank you, Thank Mr. you Ambassador. Mr. Placido. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, on behalf of the men and women of the Drug Enforcement Administration, I'd like to thank you for your continued support, and I'll cut directly to the chase. Drug trafficking and abuse exist, uh, exacts a significant toll on the American public. More than 31,000 Americans, or approximately 10 times the number of people killed on 9-11, die each year as a direct result of drug abuse. Approximately 7 million people who are addicted to controlled substances squander their productive potential. Many of these addicts neglect or abuse their children and commit a variety of crimes under the influence of or in an attempt to obtain illicit drugs. Tens of millions more suffer from this erstwhile victimless crime uh, as law-abiding citizens are forced to share the roads with drug drivers, to clean up toxic waste from clandestine laboratories, rehabilitate addicts, incarcerate criminals, and put together the pieces of shattered lives. However, if we want to 
assess the true cost of this threat, we have to go further. And we have to look at the impact that transnational drug trafficking has <clears throat> on corrupting government institutions, undermining confidence in the rule of law, fueling violence, undermining regional stability, and funding terrorism. Those who organize, finance, and direct this criminal enterprise thrive in areas where government control is weak. It's no coincidence that the so-called kingpins who run this global trade do not reside in the United States where they would be most exposed to our criminal justice system. They operate from locations which they perceive to be safe havens and they direct the activity of subordinates and surrogates who supply drugs to the United States. Drug trafficking is a global enterprise that generates a staggering $394 billion a year. This figure dwarfs the proceeds from all other forms of organized crime. Let me put this number in context. In aggregate, that $394 billion exceeds the gross domestic product of many national governments around the globe. Some would argue that legalization and regulation, even at the cost of untold human suffering and misery, would at least strip the proceeds, uh, th this economic fund, from the market. But both common sense and history have taught us that those who are displaced from the drug trade don't move into corporate life. They morph into other areas of criminality. And what we really are faced with uh, is fighting people who put personal greed above all else. Parts of Central America, West Africa, and Asia have become havens for criminals who pursue illicit activities largely undeterred by law enforcement or local government. Drug traffickers use these regions for the production, transshipment, and storage of illicit drugs. Violent traffickers are relocating to take advantage of these permissive environments and importing their own brand of justice, contributing to further instability. Unfortunately, areas with limited or poor governance are also the breeding grounds for other types of criminal activity to include terrorism. 18 of 44 international terrorist groups have been linked to some aspect of the, of the international drug trade. Today, the FARC is primarily funded through the drug trade. It sells multi-ton quantities of cocaine and uses the, the proceeds to purchase weapons for use in the FARC's decades-long fight to topple the legitimate government of Colombia. Similarly, insurgents in Afghanistan and terrorists in the Middle East, Europe, and Africa fund their activities through the drug trade. The DEA has documented hundreds of millions of dollars in proceeds from drug trafficking flowing to the Taliban. In, Afga in Africa, international terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb rely on criminal specialists closely linked to the drug trade for money laundering, document forgery, transportation, security, weapons, corruption, and other criminal activities. In Europe, the Madrid train bombing was funded through the sale of hashish and ecstasy. And DEA investigations have disclosed significant linkages between Hezbollah and the drug trade in Africa the Middle East, and Latin America. However, these transnational threats do not have to involve insurgency or terrorism to warrant our, con our concern. In spite of President Calderon's extraordinary steps to deploy more than 45,000 military troops to assist the police in combating cartel influence, there's still been more than 18,000 murders, uh, drug-related murders, in the last three years. More troubling is the fact that many of these murders were intentionally committed to try and intimidate the public uh, and influence the government to stop its activities. From the war on terrorism to our southwest border, transnational drug trafficking threatens the security of Americans at home and abroad. In Afghanistan, U.S. soldiers are fighting an insurgency that is substantially funded by the drug trade. In our own hemisphere, ever-increasing rates of violence threaten the security of our borders and those of our neighbors. Let me conclude by saying that the consequences of drug trafficking have never been higher. We must continue our efforts uh, to mitigate this damage, or we will certainly pay a higher price later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Placido. Mr. Zubin. Thank you. Chairman Tierney. Ranking Member Flake, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the role played by the Treasury Department in combating the threat posed by transnational drug enterprises. We work alongside the agencies represented here and many others in our government to add financial expertise and our unique authorities to our collective counter-narcotics <coughs> efforts. And financial sanctions can be a powerful tool. Top-level Colombian traffickers 
have told us that they fear three things above all else. The first, arrest and extradition to the U.S. Second, seizure of their assets. And three, being placed on the OFAC sanctions list. There is a heightened awareness of sanctions among the drug trafficking community and a fear of their consequences. Individuals and entities designated by OFAC lose access to the U.S. financial system. And U.S. persons, whether they be here or abroad, are forbidden from doing business with them. Any of their assets are immediately frozen if they are or come within the possession of a U.S. person or financial institution. And while these direct legal consequences can be highly disruptive, the informal ripple effects of our designations go much farther. In practicing their own due diligence and risk avoidance, many foreign, non-U.S. banks will immediately close the accounts and deny service to anyone who's placed on the OFAC list. Foreign companies that have no legal obligation to comply with U.S. sanctions will likewise often refuse to do business with designated parties, thereby further isolating them from legitimate commercial markets. This type of reaction is now common in Colombia, and we're beginning to see the same type of isolating impact play out in Mexico. Treasury has been targeting international drug enterprises for 15 years. In 1995, President Clinton signed Executive Order 12978, which targets Colombian drug traffickers and organizations. In 1999, Congress globalized the concept, enacting the Foreign Narcotics Kingpin Designation Act, or the Kingpin Act, which has allowed us to act against the networks of cartels worldwide. Since 1999, the President has identified 82 Tier 1 kingpins, and OFAC has designated over 500 individuals and companies that make up their support and financial networks. Just yesterday, we designated two of Colombia's most wanted drug, lo drug lords, Daniel Barrera Barrera, known as El Loco Barrera, and Pedro Oliviero Guerrero Castilla, aka Cuchillo. These drug lords operate primarily in eastern Colombia and are closely allied with the FARC, whose criminal and destabilizing activities were highlighted by Mr. Placido. In a good example of OFAC's network approach, at the same time yesterday, we also named and targeted the assets of 29 individuals and 47 companies in these drug lords' distribution, money laundering, and money concealment networks. Cooperation with host governments is vital to our work. These are transnational threats, and they warrant a transnational approach. A good example are our collective actions against the Amezcua Contreras organization. In October of 2008, we designated a company named Collins Pharmaceuticals and its associated officials. The company had manufactured pseudoephedrine and diverted it to drug trafficking organizations for the production of methamphetamine. As a result of this action, nearly $3 million was immediately blocked in U.S. bank accounts. But following our action, Mexico's Attorney General's office blocked bank accounts in Mexico, belonging to the same individuals and entities that we had listed. In September 2009, we followed up again on the action and designated additional individuals and front companies who had been working to circumvent the earlier sanctions. Of course, we have also intensified our efforts greatly against narcotics traffickers in Afghanistan and Pakistan to support the efforts alluded to earlier by others on this panel. Treasury is actively supporting those efforts to disrupt and dismantle the narcotics networks in those countries using the same approaches that have yielded results elsewhere. In some, economic sanctions can be a highly effective tool, which, when used in concert with U.S. and foreign law enforcement authorities, can advance U.S. efforts to combat these dangerous transnational drug efforts. Thank you for your invitation and for your interest in this important matter. Thank you, Mr. Zubin. Mr. Wexler. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here, and it's particularly appropriate that uh, you invite me to testify with all my interagency colleagues, um, because this panel represents uh, the whole of government approach to this issue that we find uh, vitally important. We've all seen the disruptive effect of illegal trafficking. Unfortunately, looking back over time, most governments around the world, including ours, have historically compartmentalized these threats into categories that fit our bureaucratic organizations. There are national security threats, there are intelligence threats, there are law enforcement threats, there's health concerns, there's commerce concerns, there's education concerns. 
As a result, again, historically, um, each bureaucratic arm addressed the threat according to its respective organization's perspective without as much cross-cutting uh, uh, organization and integration as to maximize our effectiveness. The predictable result in those instances has been lack of uniformity and marginal results. Where we have had this inter-agency inter coordinated approach, we've had quite powerful results as well. Um, in the Obama administration, the United States is attempting to address these shortcomings by promoting a whole of government approach designed to dismantle bureaucratic barriers that have long prevented implementation of a centralized method of attacking these threats to global stability and U.S. national security. As my colleagues have, uh, have described, in some parts of the world, broken communities become breeding grounds for criminal activities of all kind, including all types of illicit trafficking, drugs, weapons, people, cash. Lawless environments make inviting sanctuaries for religious zealots, political ideologues, insurgents, and terrorists, all sharing a common proclivity for violence and destruction. Such groups seek to evade or neutralize the forces of order. Their common needs allow them to, to cohabit in an environment where the government is weak and the populace can be controlled by bribes, intimidation, violence, and corruption. All types of organizations expand power bases and corrupt and control more communities. They become more formidable. Eventually, criminal and extremist organizations may be able to carve out safe havens in part of the world, and at times they become direct threats to U.S. national security in which the Department of Defense has to become involved directly. A coordinated interagency response is critical to defeating the threats posed by these transnational drug enterprises. My office's principal role is to provide counter-narcotic support to domestic law enforcement agencies and foreign security forces conducting counter-narcotics missions. The Department has also concluded uh, from experience, quite often painful experience, that the kinds of enemies that we are fighting on the battlefield today and the kinds of enemies that we expect to fight in the battlefield in the years to come are going to, uh, are going to be um, uh, financed, supported, or, and organized in part by the transnational illicit networks and especially drug uh, networks. Therefore, we in the Department of Defense have to reach out to our interagency colleagues who have great, uh, much more experience, expertise, and in particular authorities in dealing with these threats in order to integrate them into our military efforts to make um, our efforts as uh, successful as possible. Um, in addition to these kinds of support that we provided in the past, the Department of Defense is trying to increase its supporting role in addressing threat finance more generally. Terrorists and insurgents typically rely on irregular ways to fund their activities, including crime, donation from non-governmental organizations, using front companies, various black market activities that, uh, that Adam talked about. Um, only, only recently, uh, we have developed the, all the, the weaponry that we need to really attack these, uh, uh, these financial networks. Um, and we cannot overemphasize enough that a successful effort in this nature will be accomplished only with an interagency whole of government approach. Um, it's critical uh, for us, for, for our way of thinking of addressing the asymmetric warfare um, that, we're, that we're confronting today and we expect to confront in the future. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to discuss this issue. I look forward to answering all the committee's questions. Thank you, Mr. Wexler. Thank all of you for your testimony. This is a uh, perplexing area, to say the least. I, I know your jobs are challenging. Uh, we appreciate what you do. Uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, let me start with, with a sort of procedural question here. Um, I understand you don't yet have in place all the key staff you need. Uh, what expectations do you have on staffing up, and where's the status of that? We're working very hard at, uh, at, at getting the people on board. Uh, one of the concerns has been uh, uh, the deputy director. One of the deputy directors uh, was uh, voted out in, uh, in November and is still awaiting confirmation. Uh, He's out so of committee and, and waiting full Senate confirmation? That's exactly right, Mr. Chairman. So I, I think it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes to get the job done if you don't have all the folks in place. Well, perhaps you know, we can engage our, our colleagues here. Maybe we'll... Uh, be able to communicate with the Senate, our, our desire at least, that this office gets staffed up and that you have the tools that you need to move forward uh, on that. Uh, I, I'm sort of always struck by this idea that uh, it's all driven by money, at least it seems to all be driven by money, then therefore the power and, and everything on that basis. And I, and I wonder of all the different methods that we have to it, so address that, which ones are really, really effective or are we just chasing our tails on some of this stuff? I, I can't imagine the frustration of the DEA, you know, sort of fighting the same fight over and over again every day, and it seems to pop up somewhere else. So I want to ask each of you a question and, and answer it if you can. 
we have the, the drugs, obviously, so you can go after the drugs, interdiction or, or somewhere like that. You can go after the money uh, on that. You can go after the precursors, if you can, so that they can't make the drugs in the end. Uh, or you can sort of attack the one thing that we have some control over, I guess, in this country is the user, the end user, trying to diminish that. Of those, if I've missed something, please tell me that, but of all those ideas, which do you think is the more effective, just so I can get something from each of you? The money. Uh, I think choking off the money has not uh, been um, um, as much of a whole of government approach as you're seeing here today. Uh, I also don't think that when it comes to seizing those assets that, uh, that state and local law enforcement, where I spent the vast majority of my career at, uh, at the local level, I don't think that they have been in, as engaged in working with federal partners on choking off money. Uh, we've all seen the press conferences with the arrests and the people in handcuffs. We've seen the seizures of uh, guns and drugs laid out on the table. It's not that exciting to uh, seize a bank account. And, uh, and I think that if we really concentrate the way you're, uh, uh, it's been expressed here, I think what we will have a better opportunity to choke off money. And in turn, that is the lifeblood of these cartels. Ambassador Johnson. I, I think that, uh, that, that the, the monetary driver of this is something you always have to keep your eye on. It is the, it's the reason these people get up in the morning. They, it, it, you know, they're, they're not interested in trading cocaine for its own sake. But the, the, I think it's important to peel back a little bit and figure out how you go about that. And from, from my point of view, uh, and this is, I guess this is because what I do for a living, but helping foreign governments build the institutions of governance is the long run durable answer to this problem. And that gets at the money uh, as part of that. Getting at the money is a, is a first level, first is, is a rifle shot, uh, and it has to be followed up and followed up and followed up. But helping build those institutions with our foreign partners gives people in the DEA and the Treasury and other places in our government partners to work with. And it's, it goes back to the, to the main problem here, and that is that ungoverned space will bite you. And whether it's ungoverned space in a remote part of the world or it's ungoverned space in a, in a neighborhood in a, in a close by country. That's, I think, where the, the key to dealing with this problem. And it goes directly to that question of how do you make money on the street? Mr. Posito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Uh, I would just say that I've spent the better part of my 31 years in this profession wrestling with the question that you've asked. And I've come to the conclusion that there is no silver bullet. There's no uh, one tool that will eliminate this problem, but rather many. What I will say is, uh, as a matter of personal preference in, in my organization, the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, has come to the conclusion that the, the notion that we've got a war on drugs suggests that we're fighting against the contraband itself, and, and that we don't believe that's true. We're really fighting against organizations, and it's an organizational attack strategy uh, designed to go after the people and the, the greed uh, of those who put personal profit above all else. Uh, and I, uh, I believe you, you heard Mr. Zubin and others talk about the things that these traffickers fear most uh, is really their own well-being. It, certainly they're concerned about their money and the profit is the reason that they get involved in the business, uh, but it is actually taking these people out of circulation where their money can't buy corruption, can't help them, uh, where they can't benefit from that and, and actually incarcerating these people for long periods of time. And I think that's the reason why the so-called kingpins, or as we now call them, the consolidated priority organization targets, don't reside here. Uh, within the confines of the United States, we do a pretty fine job of uh, motivating people uh, to stay out of our jurisdiction. Uh, that's not true around the world, and that's why we have to build these partnerships around the globe as they're looking for safe havens and refuge. Mr. Zubin, uh, if we can quickly, I, th I know over my time. And it, it won't come as a surprise that for us the focus is money. No, no, uh, I knew everybody's focus was. I think people have been pretty good about stepping outside of that if they yes. thought something else was, uh, was but effective. I, I, I think the effectiveness can be really significant for all the reasons mentioned. And when we're talking about the money of these traffickers, it's not just the uh, bulk cash smuggling that people often picture that's secreted in a compartment in a truck, you know, heading down to Mexico. It's what are these narcotics organizations doing with the money, doing with their profits? They're not putting it under their mattresses. They're investing it in often appearing uh, seemingly legitimate businesses. 
and they'll develop networks of companies, whether they're companies that they use directly in their trafficking uh, enterprises. We just this week uh, designated a, a trucking company that was affiliated with a narcotics organization. Well, a trucking company is very useful. Small aircraft companies are very useful. Uh, but more broadly, retail operations are very useful. If you have a, a pharmaceutical company, you've got an excuse for coming into banks with large sacks of cash because you've got customers coming in and you have receipts. So uh, we see them putting the money in these, in these accounts, in these companies to launder it, to conceal it. And when we talk about going after the money, we're talking about going after their treasure houses, going after their bank accounts, their financial holdings abroad. And I, I think the, the impact there can be palpable uh, and not just the impact on the, the worst of the traffickers, but the deterrent impact on those who might otherwise have said, I'll go into business with you, I'll agree to serve as a corporate officer. We, we try to name all of those people who are found on the Dun and Bradstreet <laughs> sheets uh, for these companies, and we see them then coming to us and saying, I want off the list, I won't have anything to do with you fill in the blank drug organization, just take me off your list. And so it's a behavior changing tool as well. Thank you. Mr. Webster. Um, I, uh, I would echo in many ways what, what Tony has said, that um, rather than looking for, for one, the, the, the critical element that is, so, that is too often missing is the integration of all of these efforts. And I would suggest as, as one place to, to look for a successful uh, effort to, to date, although not final, is in Colombia. Um, there, uh, in the late 1990s, um, the Colombian people, when polled, two-thirds of them believed that the FARC, that it, was either, that it was very likely that the FARC was going to take Bogota and take over the whole country. Now the FARC is a, uh, uh, controls only a sliver of territory and is, only, is a shadow of what it was. There's still many problems there. We don't want to, we don't want to, want to discount them. But taking a long-range, multi-year approach, bringing in all the lines of operation, the financial operation, the law enforcement operation, the capacity building operation to foreign countries, the military and special forces operation, the intelligence operations, and integrating it as a whole under the leadership of strong local leadership as we had in, in Colombia is what can succeed and can really change the game. Thank you. Mr. Flake, take eight. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've enjoyed this testimony. It's been very enlightening. Uh, Mr. Zubin, um, you had mentioned that it, the importance of uh, having agreement with the host countries uh, where <clears throat> we're trying to target uh, some of this illicit action. Uh, can you talk a little about uh, uh, third countries, and particularly in Europe with the banking system? A lot of this money, as you said, isn't put in mat under mattresses. It, it moves throughout the system. How has the cooperation been with our European allies, for example, uh, with regard to the movement of money in South America or Middle East or elsewhere through Europe? I would say it's been very good in, in our area, and, and I would certainly leave it to Ambassador Johnson and others to, to talk more broadly. Uh, but when it comes to isolating named kingpins and their networks, the Europeans are extremely supportive of our efforts, and the European banks are, uh, even without the cooperation of their governments. Large, reputable banks in Europe do not want to be doing any business with somebody who ends up on the wrong side of a kingpin listing. And uh, it's a, a very powerful reinforcing impact, because it means what is technically, perhaps legally, a unilateral sanction under the, the congressionally enacted Kingpin Act ends up spilling out in terms of its effects across the globe. Thank you. Now, Mr. Zubin's too much of a diplomat to say this, but, uh, but I will. Um, I, I think part of the, the issue, you mentioned that uh, um, uh, Mr. Kurlikowski mentioned that uh, in the past, maybe the, a weaker link has been the money side. And, and part of the issue we've had was uh, the wide portfolio that OFAC, uh, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, has had. Uh, few people outside of government realize that OFAC administers the travel ban we have on Cuba. And uh, in the past, I think far too much time and resources has had to be devoted, not their choice, it's Congress's edict, uh, to issuing travel licenses for individuals to travel to Cuba and, to, and looking at that angle. And, and I, I think that that has, in the past, has had uh, the effect of diverting too much attention uh, from the real uh, matters that matter right now, and that is to intercept uh, these money transfers. And, uh, but I, I've worked with uh, Mr. Zubin before, and I know that they have the right priorities, and they're, they're uh, 
uh, doing, doing well and focusing more, partly because some of those restrictions on travel have been lifted and it perhaps has made it easier and, and less of a drain on that office. But, uh, but I want to commend you for how you're handling that. And, and also, I want to appeal to my colleagues to, to change it and free up OFAC to do what it needs to do uh, with more of the time and resources. And so, anyway, just for that. But uh, let's, let's talk about, did you have a comment on that? I just wanted to say that uh, European governments have been very careful in trying to work with us on this issue. They probably exercise more care than sometimes we would like to make sure that they don't get a bad precedent set which would right. tie their hands. But the issue that Adam raised about uh, the banking institutions themselves I think has been probably the most important and the most effective, and that is the, the banking institutions, particularly those that hang up signs that you see, are extremely concerned about their own reputational risk and bringing things to their attention about what those risks are and helping them with their compliance programs has been an extraordinarily effective tool that, that Treasury has, has worked very hard with the Europeans. So it sounds as if the contacts are made with the banks themselves as opposed to the governments uh, in which these banks are uh, located. I, I, it's both, um, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, it's been uh, more creative, if you will, uh, on the reputational side. And, and this is a, a new tool, and I, I compliment Treasury because they've, they've really worked this issue hard. That, that's good to hear. It's good to hear. Uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, the Southwest Border Initiative, you mentioned uh, earlier um, announcement. Uh, what, how is that going to change uh, what's going on on the Southwest Border? Those of us from Arizona are particularly interested in this. I, I have been to the Southwest Border now three times, and uh, over my career, my, my colleagues in the major cities all along those states uh, have uh, oftentimes in our meetings reflected upon the, the real problems that they have been facing. I think there are a couple important changes with the Southwest Border Initiative. One is that there has been a very active involvement of state and locals that I don't think had been brought into the fold as much before. Uh, there was concern in the past that, look, we're already pretty busy in these uh, sheriff's departments with literally thousands of square miles, as, as you know, and not an awful lot of deputies. Uh, but they have really stepped up to the plate. They really understand that, uh, that by partnering with the federal government, that's important. The second thing that I think is important is this new initiative and focus on guns going south and cash uh, or the, the assets or proceeds going south. And so both the government of Mexico making those uh, choices to inspect cars coming into the country, which had really not been done in the past, uh, those things are important. So I see the continuing cooperation and, uh, and work of everybody coming together uh, having perhaps uh, <laughs> Uh, some significant effects in the course of this year. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Um, let's say, Director Zubin, first, um, which are the countries that currently provide safe haven for the drug traffickers' finances? Is there a, a short list of countries that are most prominent? No, I, I, I don't think we find that there are uh, countries that are affirmatively stepping up to operate as, as safe have havens. Uh, certainly, there are areas that are less well regulated and where the, the banking sector, the financial industry writ large, is less aware of the types of risk factors that I was talking about earlier that have become so um, central to banks in Latin America. And our, our efforts alongside state, alongside all of our colleagues, are of course to raise the tide for, for all boats and to try to see the kind of careful compliance efforts by banks around the world and to see governments also uh, doing more across the board. When they improve their anti-money laundering practices, that helps in terms of the narcotics effort. When they improve <laughs> sanctions implementation efforts, that helps. Uh, you know, narcotics is touching on so many different areas that our technical assistance activities, our capacity building activities that have been flagged so well by uh, Director Kurlikowski and Ambassador Johnson are, are uh, helping us throughout the world. And how connected is this to the efforts to um, get at bank secrecy laws um, used for tax evasion? Are these, are these very similar efforts or are they really disjoint? I would say they're, they're separate and people tend to draw a distinction in, in foreign discussions between uh, tax issues and uh, counter narcotics or other sort of mainstream criminal organization issues. And so I see them as separate, but I would certainly defer to my 
colleagues to, to comment. I, I think they, they are separate. I'd say, um, obviously, some of the capacity building about bank regulation can have an impact on both issues. But on, on tax regulation, we're looking more at our what our own citizens are doing, and in the uh, in the in the money laundering, we're tending to focus on on what others are doing, and those tend to involve as much domestic transactions as they do international transactions. Mm -hmm. And are there additional legislative tools or international agreements um, that you really need to make these financial pressure on the the drug cartels more effective? The main tool we use, as, as I noted, is the, uh, the Kingpin Act, and it's a very powerful authority that Congress gave the administration back in 1999. It allows us, it allows the president to name what we refer to as tier one kingpins, whether an organization or a major trafficker, and then it falls on us in the Treasury to follow up. And I, I, when I say us in the Treasury, I'm not really speaking about a single agency effort by any means, because it's the intelligence, the law enforcement information from our colleagues at this table that, that are the fuel for these actions. But what we ideally do is go after the, the companies, the front companies, shell companies, money laundering vehicles, the accountants, the lawyers that are propping up these networks and that are allowing them to, to launder and to conceal their funds, and ideally put them out of commission. Now, I, I don't want to uh, give you the mistaken impression that every time we take a sanction action, it means the company closes down. Uh, there are times when we have to keep at it for years and employ diplomatic efforts and, and uh, uh, persuasion to try to, to bring foreign law enforcement to bear, it, whether that's in a seizure or forfeiture or uh, pulling the company's registration altogether. But sometimes uh, the coordination works so well that the, the effects really are immediate. Mm -hmm. so, so you think it's a fair statement that you're limited by your manpower and foreign cooperation at this point rather than your legislative authority? There's no, no times that you... I, I don't view the legislative authorities as okay. holding us back in any way. And then I guess a, a question just for anyone who wants to feel it is, has there ever been any attempt at a sort of unified economic analysis to see where we should put our money to get the most bang for the buck, you know, just to try to figure out, um, you know, some sort of metrics for, um, you know, how to minimize the eco economic damage to drugs in the United States? and the indirect cost to our military and just, you know, some sort of bottom line and say, okay, you know, given that, um, how, where do we put our resources? Um, you know, you could put them anywhere from, you know, bribing um, Afghan farmers to grow something else to um, try to, you know, in better enforcement on the streets of cities in the U.S. and anywhere in between. And have, has there ever been any group that's just tried to look at the whole, the economics of the whole thing and, and identify the best return on investment? It depends on which group I'm talking to. Uh, uh, it's, it's been interesting, but um, uh, the two areas that actually you uh, uh, left out, the prevention uh, programs are critically important. If we reduce our demand here in the United States, if these other countries, and I just came back from, from Russia, uh, uh, I have heard from, from every country now that I have visited of their growing uh, addict populations. Uh, it's a significant drain on dollars. Um, a small amount of investment in prevention. We know that treatment is about half the cost of incarceration and that treatment can in fact be effective. Uh, none of this means or diminishes that, uh, that we're reducing the power of law enforcement or the importance of law enforcement. And in fact, oftentimes people go into treatment with handcuffs on. Uh, so I think that that might be important. When it comes to the, to the, uh, to the other areas that you had talked about, it's often been uh, said that uh, if our goal in eradication is to reduce the amount of drugs coming into the United States uh, would be analogous to uh, reducing the number of diamonds by uh, removing the lumps of coal. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons for various eradication programs, a number of good reasons for it. But if you really look at how it's going to reduce the amount of uh, drugs that are in the United States, that is probably at the lowest end of that tier. All right. Well, I thank you. I guess my time's expired, and so now I'll recognize um, Representative Micah. Well, thank you, and I'm glad we uh, are conducting this uh, hearing. I had the privilege of chairing this subcommittee or its predecessor back uh, 98 to 2000, and I think uh, responsibility for oversight is extremely important. I am dismayed, however, at the systematic dismantling, and we heard we, we're not even supposed to talk about a war on drugs, um, 
when this administration comes in and takes your position, Mr. Kurlikowski, takes it out of the cabinet. Uh, uh, to me, lessens uh, its uh, importance of visibility. Um, the, some of the efforts to promote legalization may be well intended, but uh, they do have consequences. And some of the reduced enforcement, all of this uh, uh, will end up uh, uh, with more young people in particular uh, who look to role models and also look to leadership, uh, believe it or not, uh, and uh, the direction from the highest office of the United States uh, towards uh, their attitudes of uh, uh, drug use and drug abuse. So I think we're headed downhill. I, I saw some statistics the other day I thought were disturbing with crime uh, down uh, generally across the country. We still have uh, young people uh, addicted and uh, was it Mr. Uh, who gave the statistic, uh, Placido, uh, 31,000 deaths. Uh, uh, it is by far the, the, the worst uh, social uh, and criminal problem that we have in, in the United States. But uh, uh, the other thing, too, is you have to put, you're talking about putting resources uh, and, and what's most effective on the international scene, and that is important. I want to talk about that. But uh, aren't most of the drugs still coming in to the United States from the Caribbean and South America through the bo southwest border and Florida? Is that right, Mr. Kurlikowski, Mr. Placido? Is that, is that right, Mr. Placido? Uh, particularly with cocaine, we estimate now that the interagency estimates about 91 percent of the cocaine crosses the southwest border, significant yeah, amounts of I meth. I was down in San Juan Heroin. and got a briefing by the Coast Guard. And they showed me the charts of the, the drugs coming out of South America. They, they traced the, the planes coming out. They were, were, were solid red lines coming still out of there. So it's coming into Florida. It's coming, uh, it, some of it was going up to Mexico and then transiting in. W were you consulted, Mr. Kurlikowski, or uh, and anyone else here, when the administration proposed to cut the Coast Guard positions by 1,100 to mothball five recently upgraded helicopters, reducing the Coast Guard's anti-drug operations in Florida, where I just happened to live, and the Caribbean, which we just cited was the main source, uh, main source of these people bringing this crap in, uh, th that would dramatically reduce our, uh, our, our nation's capability. Were you consulted on these cuts? No. You were, were you consulted, anyone on the panel? Okay. Uh, I was appalled. I'm going to the budget hearing in a few hours and speak about that. I've gone to the Coast Guard hearing, and actually both sides of the aisle uh, uh, were, were just stunned at the administration's proposal. Furthermore, uh, in the same budget, to cut uh, uh, border uh, protection, uh, fencing technology, and infrastructure by more than, well, it's almost a, a a uh, quarter of a billion dollars, 225 million. Were you, were you consulted, Mr. Kurlikowski, the drugs are on this? I wasn't consulted on the fencing, but I do know there are significant concerns about how effective that uh, program has been. Well, again, our job is to take the resources and, and, and make them effective. And I'm looking for that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not here just to criticize you. Uh, we want this successful. Those kids are dying in our our streets. I can tell you the names of parents I've talked to in the last year that have lost their, their kid uh, with uh, drug overdoses and drug uh, abuse. Uh, 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 Mr. Or Ambassador Johnson, uh, most of the heroin that's produced in Afghanistan, I haven't been up to the border in a long time, but it used to go to Europe, is still about 90 some percent going to Europe of that heroin. Uh, I don't think 90 percent goes. Okay. Well, what? Just come on. How much? Almost none of it comes to the United all States. All right. All right. That was my point. Uh, you said in your statement, I, I took it down, requires a global effort. Now, I don't think the United States, and I used to be involved in these panels and legislative panels, and you guys listen here, the new members here who haven't been around. We need to get some of our folks into these discussions. Again, legislative people who set the policy. 
and get with the uh, commissioners, get with the European Union and others because they do have clout. And if we talk to them member to member, interparliamentary discussions to get the EU to do more, that crap is coming into, into Europe and they're suffering. And they should be, how much are they doing as far as uh, 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 programs in Afghanistan? What share are they doing now? Well, the the uh, Europeans are contributing significantly to ISAF forces, uh, notwithstanding the no the the drugs uh, substitu on the crop substitutions, others. Yes, uh, particularly the European Union Commission and the uh, the British government. Uh, their their international. Yeah, well, I can tell you whatever they're doing. It's peanuts compared to what the United States is doing. They've lost personnel too, and we have lost personnel. But uh, they have a distinct interest in stop, stopping this heroin. And I used to go to those meetings, finally I'm over, guys, and I, we would sit there and the Europeans would poo-poo us about cocaine. Uh, we did such a good job up until most recently of stopping that cocaine from getting into the United States and the price down here that it's being diverted to Europe because it gets more dollars, right? And now they're transiting, and they have a cocaine problem from South America in Europe. But we need to get more engaged as a subcommittee and committee, and you guys need to get over there. I know this is an election year. Talk to these uh, parliamentarians who make that policy and get them engaged, not only for our benefit, but their benefit, and stop this stuff. And I thank you for letting me go over my time. Certainly. I guess now. Um, I have additional questions to submit. Representative Quigley is next in subcommittee seniority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kurlikowski, I'm just taking this a slightly different way. Um, we've been told by many, including the Secretary of State, that 90% uh, of the weapons, including assault weapons that are used in the, these drug wars that take place, are coming from the United States. Um, uh, your thoughts on uh, Re-extending the assault weapon ban as it relates to these weapons? No, uh, I had been on the record as a, as a police chief for a number of years, uh, along with many, many, many of my colleagues on the assault weapons ban. There were a number of issues surrounding that. I'm uh, sorry, if you could... There were a number of issues surrounding how effective it was. Um, uh, I would tell you that right now that the assault weapons ban issue has not even been something that I have considered only because of the amount of time that I've been devoting on the drug issue. But I will tell you this, that I think with the ATF's implementation of electronic tracing data that has now been put into Mexico in a Spanish version, uh, we will know much more uh, w with much more certainty the number of guns being seized in Mexico and where where they actually came from, whether it was uh, Guatemala, Honduras, or whether it was the United States. And I think that information will, in fact, then impact uh, future discussion. It will do what? I think that information about where the guns are coming from that are being seized in Mexico and being used to, to kill prosecutors and judges and others, I think that information about where those guns come from will be helpful to any administration. Well. Let's just say that that it allows us to determine that 70 or 80 or 90 percent of the assault weapons are coming from the United States, that they're purchased through straw purchases or, or whatever. I mean, I know that's valuable information, but you get a pretty good hunch that's the ballpark numbers now. Um, and doesn't it make sense to go forward more strongly and 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 reinstate the assault weapon ban? And I, I, I don't know that it gives anybody comfort who's lost family members through assault weapons that we know where they came from. I think it makes sense to take that information as an administration and to very carefully review it and uh, consider also the, the problems that had existed in the past around the assault weapons ban. Uh, other than that, there are a number of other uh, agencies and, uh, and secretaries that, uh, that have a, a vested interest in this uh, issue also, and I would probably defer some of those, some of those comments to them. Well, I've asked just about everybody who's come before this committee the same question, but for the time allowed, if anyone else on the panel would like to provide their insight on that thought. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Quigley. I just add one, uh, one comment, and that is um, this committee may be pleased to hear that uh, through the use of the asset forfeiture fund, that is monies that have been seized from the drug traffickers themselves, uh, we've rolled out a picket line of license plate readers uh, in general proximity to the southwest border to inspect vehicles southbound into Mexico looking for bulk cash and firearms. And I believe that we are having some success, it's the early stages now, but in actually stopping those firearms uh, from reaching Mexico in the first place. Well, and I appreciate that, but you recognize you're not going to catch them all, right? That's right. And, and that ha having a greater source, a greater volume of weapons purchased initially legally uh, makes it tougher to stop all of them. There's a, there's a bigger pool coming into the, into the country of Mexico, therefore putting more uh, innocent people, including um, Americans involved in this war, at, at risk. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And we will now recognize um, Representative Lutkemeyer for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Wexler, uh, I'm very familiar with the program that we have the National Guard troops over in Afghanistan trying to uh, teach the Afghani farmers how to produce other crops so that they would no longer produce uh, um, poppies, uh, which we get heroin from. Uh, how successful do you believe that program to be? The, um, that program, uh, which is uh, quite important, is, uh, is integrated into a number of other programs for alternative crop development. Um, the, uh, the Secretary of Agriculture has uh, personally gone out there and uh, uh, to, to give his advice and guidance. Um, it is from the Department of Defense, is exper uh, recent experience at least, the first time that we're integrating the Department of Agriculture into our war efforts. Mm -hmm. um, and it's critical that we do so. Um, one thing that I would uh, call your attention to is that um, not too long ago, in the 1970s, the area of Afghanistan that we're talking about uh, was not a massive source of drugs. Uh, it was a massive source of, um, of, of regular agricultural produce that was part of the global market and made its way to market. And people had, uh, had, had healthy, vibrant um, communities based on that. Um, this is uh, the, the efforts that we're doing there are not to, to do crop substitution and alternative development efforts are not going to succeed overnight. Um, in fact, they're going to take quite, quite a long time given how much damage has been done um, and they're integrated into our wider coin efforts to do so. But, um, but it at least gives some degree of, of, uh, of comfort to note that there was a time not too, in too distant past where um, uh, uh, that, that provides a, a vision of where we might be going again. Yeah, I, uh, I come from Missouri, and we have our National Guard group was the first one to go over there, and we now have our group over there for the third, third tour. And in meeting with uh, Colonel Lepper last week with regards to his oversight over the, uh, the program, it's been, uh, in my view, pretty successful. And I think it's probably, as you indicated, an integral part of any sort of ability of us to transform that country and cut off the flow of drug money uh, if they don't produce the the agricultural crop from which they derive the drug, it's going to be more difficult for them to, the Taliban, to be able to uh, fund themselves. So as a result of the success of the program, have you, are you thinking about promoting it somewhere else in the world, or is this uh, the, the pilot project and uh, the verdict still uh, yet to be determined? Well, well, we still have a lot of work to do in Afghanistan. Uh, right. to be, uh, and um, again, this, this work is um, going, to, going to take place over, over a number of years. Um, and it's not just, of course, going to be a military activity, but it's a wider whole of government activity to do so because once we, once we take the territory, we have to then hold the territory right. and build the territory, and building the territory means a lot of things, and one of the things that it means is bringing this territory back into an economic uh, zone where they can feed themselves and, uh, and meet their own needs without having to rely on um, uh, drug trade, which, and it's also important to note, for the individual farmer, there are a number of crops that provide a lot more in the way of money and value to that farmer that are completely legal than opium. Uh, we just need to build the infrastructure around and build a security structure around that we can, um, that they can make the, 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 the logical financial decision to move in that direction. Right now they're not in that position, too many of them. 
Yeah, I realize it's a long-term process, but I think it's a huge step in the right direction. If you can transform the economy, you can you can earn the trust of the people. If you earn the trust of the people, you can you can root out the Taliban, and I think that's that's where we're headed. And I think you know, uh, from my discussions and my uh, you know knowledge of the program, it seems to be working very very well. Um, Mr. Placido, with regards to um, uh, threats around the world, what do you feel right now is the most um, well, the most significant threat or what you feel is the, the, the rising threat from whatever area or whatever country that's uh, sort of top of mind and ones we really need, need to focus in on? I think it's I'm, very difficult to, uh, to put them in, in a rank order because it's, we're not comparing apples to apples. Uh, my personal, uh, and I think where this administration has been, is to really focus on Mexico, which is the arrival zone for three of the major four drugs that are abused in the United States and because of its geographic proximity to the United States. While we're concerned about lawlessness uh, across the globe, be it West Africa or Afghanistan, uh, there, is, there is a certain urgency that is felt when, uh, when there's instability to our immediate south. And so I, I think that uh, this administration and my agency have spent a lot of time focusing on Mexico, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, Mr. Kalikowski, what do you think about that? When I look at the 2,000-mile border and the amount of uh, uh, and, 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 the, and the level of violence, uh, I would say that Mexico is, is very clearly uh, one where we should uh, uh, concentrate time, effort, and resources. Uh, General McCaffrey was just recently down there along with uh, a, a number of other people. I don't think it quite gets the attention right now that, uh, that other places in the world do get. Uh, but after that, I think uh, working on the uh, global cartel issues, because we not only see the flow coming through Mexico at, at times and into the United States, we see a flow coming out of South America into West Africa, Europe, the UK. Uh, et cetera. And um, uh, somebody had mentioned we're all in this lifeboat together with increasing addict populations and increasing uh, uh, drug problems. So uh, uh, when, when Tony talks about this uh, uh, shared cooperation, particularly among law enforcement agencies, uh, regardless of nation, I think that that has the most potential. But Mexico would be at the top of my list. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Luke Meyer. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it was mentioned a while ago that 91 percent of the heroin comes up from South America, but uh, Mr. Placido just said three of the four major drugs are primarily coming through Mexico. What uh, do we know? What percentage of the drugs, uh, the drug activity overall, is is coming from Mexico? Sir. Um if I misspoke, let me correct myself. 90, the interagency assesses that 91 percent of the cocaine uh, which enters the United States actually, uh, whether it comes through the Caribbean or up the Isthmus of Central America, finds its way into Mexico to cross the southwest border. So that's oh. cocaine. Um, oh, okay. We also, the, the four principal illicit drugs of abuse would be marijuana, methamphetamine, heroin, and cocaine. And what we know is that uh, in addition to 91 percent of the cocaine transiting Mexico before it arrives, uh, a very large percentage of the methamphetamine abused in the United States is either manufactured in or, or comes from Mexico. Uh, I don't know that we can put a number on it with precision. I've heard numbers, uh, you know, that range from the 70 to 80 percent range. Uh, whether those are accurate or not, it's a significant amount. Uh, and we also get a, a very large percentage of the heroin, which is either manufactured in Mexico uh, or South American heroin, principally from Colombia, that transits Mexico on its way to the United States. So Mexico has become a very uh, critical transshipment point for, for many of the drugs that arrive in the United States. Well, how is, how is that, uh, how are those drugs coming in? I know there's thousands of uh, trucks that come from Mexico every day is most of it coming in on these on these trucks or are they or how's it coming in well uh, i suspect that if we knew with precision the the answer we, we could really do something about it what we know is that the seizures that we do affect uh, reflect ingenuity by the traffickers uh, million dollar a copy self-propelled semi-submersible 
vessels, essentially a poor man's submarine, uh, that are used on a one-way trip where the, the drugs are ballast, uh, bring it up into the Isthmus of Central America and into Mexico, uh, where it's staged and moves across the border. Uh, we see backpacking of marijuana and other drugs across the border between ports of entry, uh, ingenious concealments in vehicles and on rail cars uh, going across the border. Given the, the enormous profit uh, that's at stake, the traffickers have, uh, have used planes, trains, and automobiles, and, and I'm sure some modes of conveyance that we have not even learned of yet, but uh, what we do know is that based on the seizures that we make, the arrests, and the information that we develop, uh, that, that despite our best efforts, they are successful in smuggling large quantities of drugs into this country. What, what percentage of the uh, vehicles coming from Mexico are, are inspected uh, for drugs uh, each day? I'm afraid I'm not uh, the best person to address that question. That would probably be best addressed by somebody in the, the Bureau of Customs and Border Protection. Uh, what I can say for the record is that it is a, it's a relatively small number and there's a constant tension between facilitating lawful commerce across the border right. uh, and inspecting for contraband. Yes, sir. There, I mean, in, in, in some manner of speaking, there's a 100 percent inspection, but the CBP, uh, Customs and Border Protection, has to make a decision as to whether a vehicle or a, sh a, a trailer deserves further. They have a range of equipment to do so, but uh, as uh, Tony was mentioning, the uh, ability and ingenuity of these individuals to secrete place their product in places that cavities in cars that people don't know exist uh, really requires kind of a, a, a special touch by the, the, the customs people to, to, to discern who might be a little dodgy and, and go after them in a very concentrated way. All right. Well, it, it, it seems to me, uh, uh, you know, a few minutes ago it was said that uh, almost none of these drugs uh, in Afghanistan are, are coming to the United States. They're, they're going to Europe. It uh, seems to me that we should uh, direct uh, almost all of this uh, effort uh, in Mexico and, and where the problem really exists and, and instead of uh, to places where the problem doesn't exist. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Duncan. Ms. Chu, you recognize five minutes. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I know all too well how the violence of the Mexican drug cartels can affect us here in the U.S. <clears throat> Last December, one of my constituents was the innocent victim of the drug cartels in Mexico. His name was uh, <clears throat> Bobby Salcedo, and he was uh, abducted and murdered uh, along with um, five other men while visiting family members in Durango, Mexico. He was an elected official and a rising star in our community. Um, neither he nor the other five men had any connection to the cartels or the drug trade. They were just in the wrong place in the wrong time. Uh, since Mr. Salcedo was murdered, I've been in touch with the Secretary of State, representatives from the FBI and uh, representatives from the Mexican government to try to understand how we can bring the killers to justice and al also how we can curb the violence of the drug cartels. Uh, so I have questions on the Merida initiative and uh, money laundering spe specifically with regard to Mexico. First on the <clears throat> Merida initiative, uh, we know that this was um, started in 2007, um, <clears throat> but that out of the uh, $830 million that's been appropriated for Merida, only $26 million has been spent as of September 2009. Um, what I like to ask is the Merida initiative I believe was a very important first step towards a stronger and more cooperative relationship between the US and Mexico uh, but the official agreement ended last year and uh, the administration has not yet come up with a co comprehensive plan to succeed this initiative what are the plans for the future and what would be your recommendations um, thank you madam congresswoman I, I I th a, a couple of preliminary comments. Uh, I, I think that the, the Merida Initiative represents a new and uh, comprehensive method of cooperation between us and the Mexican authorities, and the type of engagement we've had with them during the course of this is, is in a different plane than it has been before. Uh, we are, this, this is an ongoing program. What we're trying to do working with the Mexicans is trying to figure out what kind of the next steps are beyond 
what we've already committed to do together, what sort of mirror the two, if you, if you will, will be. But our, our work with them under the current program continues unabated and is, and is very, very aggressive. Second point I'd, I'd like to make is, is while that $26 million number that you cited from the, from the GAO report is correct in terms of quote unquote expended, it doesn't really reflect what's been done. For example, uh, the appropriation for the Black Hawk helicopters that have been, been purchased, that will not appear as an expended fund for some time because we don't actually pay the bills until the, the product is delivered, accepted, and everything's done in order to protect the taxpayer. Those aircraft have already been manufactured. They've been delivered by Sikorsky. They're at, uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, being, being modified uh, for the Mexicans' needs, and they'll be delivered to them, we believe, sometime in, in the early to mid-summer. So many of these programs continue even though they're not reflected in that number. That doesn't mean that we don't want to accelerate that just as rapidly as we possibly can. We're very grateful to uh, Sikorsky and the Army for having found a place in the queue, if you will, to accelerate this delivery in a way that didn't affect our own Army's delivery of these helicopters, for example. We're taking as many steps like that as we can. We've delivered about 50 of these non-intrusive inspection vehicles that they require for their police and their border officials, a like number of armored vehicles. Programs we've developed to train investigators that bring in our own uh, law enforcement authorities from DEA, from FBI, from state and local government in, in Houston and Chicago and Los Angeles. So there are a number of aggressive programs going on that I think reflect more clearly the effort that we have underway with Mexico. And can you tell me what Mary that two might look like? I, I think that what, what the, the distinction will be that much of the, if you will, big ticket items have been covered under the current appropriation. Aircraft, non-intrusive inspection equipment, uh, things of that nature that are, that are truly quite expensive. As we look forward, we're going to want to concentrate much more on training and institution building and helping the Mexicans transform their police service and their courts and their prosecution so that they're much more effective. In fact, I'm, I'm glad you talked about the equipment because um, when I talked to Ambassador Sarkhan, Khan, uh, he did express concern that the Mexican government has not yet received um, some of the equipment that was promised under the Merida Initiative. Are the items that you talked about the, the main items that have not been, that are really on the books but have not yet been delivered? Uh, the items that I mentioned to you have in fact transited the border and they're in the hands of, of, of the Mexican authorities. I, I, I appreciate that the, the Mexicans want to push this as hard as they can go and get materials as quickly as they can. Um, there's been a number of deliveries already. The, the, the Bell helicopters are there as of last fall. The, these things are ongoing, uh, but we're, we're working with the Mexican authorities to move them just as quickly as we can. My um, next questions have to do with the money laundering aspect. Um, I understand that they've made progress on uh, electronic transfers of, um, <clears throat> that have to do with money laundering, but that <clears throat> there is a big problem with uh, the bulk cash smuggling and um, that there need to be more um, remedies along those lines. Uh, could you talk about that? The, the effort that we have underway with, uh, with the bulk sm cash smuggling issue that, that I'm primarily responsible for has to do with giving the Mexicans greater capacity to detect cash that's being smuggled into Mexico. As Director Kirilikowski was mentioning a few minutes ago, the Mexicans are now inspecting southbound cargo in a way that they had never done before. And they're utilizing some of this equipment that we've provided both at the land border and at air transit points and, and at uh, marine points as well. These are the type of, uh, of capabilities that will allow them to see into things as odd as uh, tractor axles where, where monies are secreted. Uh, I think that will get to part of the problem, but I, I, I have to say that that is an integral part of the larger effort to stop money laundering through financial institutions. And that a, a, continues to be a work in, in, in progress. We've made some progress on that, but there's much more to be done because we know that there are billions flowing in uh, through the accounting systems that we have in, in our banking system and theirs, uh, and we're only catching a sliver of that. Okay, thank, thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chu. Mr. Flake. I just had one more question. Um, it was, it's been said in your testimony and also we've heard from others that uh, West Africa is becoming a transit point. Um, Guinea-Bissau in particular, uh, some of the other countries. What are we doing proactively? Uh, what, what structures can we put in place now, uh, both financially and, and, and otherwise, so with, with DOD, to, to try to head this off before it becomes more of a problem? Is there something that, uh, that looking back now at Latin America and South America and everything else that we could have done more easily before it became such a big problem that we can do in West Africa. And uh, I'll go with Dr. Zubin, or Mr. Zubin first on that. It's a real challenge that you're raising. And uh, I think that the financial system there, the capacity of, of the regulatory system, the government, is really uh, not where it needs to be in order to replicate what we've been able to do in some other places. And that's not a quick fix. Right. Well, I get a lot of emails from Nigerians every day. So I, I, <laughs> I'd encourage you not to send money. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Thanks. On, on DOD side, uh, or, or anybody else who want to answer that, just uh, proactively, what can we do to make it easier before it becomes more of a problem than it is? This, this, as, as Adam mentioned, this is going to be probably harder than Latin America rather than easier. And that's because of the weak nature of these governments right. and the institutions that they have. We've, we've jointly done some assessments of their capabilities. We've worked with the DEA to help build their partners, and this is a nascent effort. Um, but we believe that the, the most effective way is going to be to invest in building institutional capacity in those governments so that they can detect, prosecute, incarcerate people, as well as build the type of linkages that we need so that they can extradite people to the United States if indeed their activities implicate criminal activity that's prosecutable under our laws. The only thing I would add, Mr. Flake, is that through the generosity of Congress, the Drug Enforcement Administration has been op able to open a, a second office in West Africa in 2009 in Accra, Ghana. Uh, and it was through the opening of that office and the creation of vetted teams that we're working with that we're able to, uh, for example, th this latest investigation linking AQIM, Al Qaeda, and the Islamic Maghreb with drug trafficking. Uh, and, and our colleagues in Ghana expel these folks and they're sitting in a prison in New York awaiting trial. So uh, there are things that can be done. Uh, I, I believe it, this is an order of magnitude problem. Uh, we're not resourced at, at a level that is commensurate with the problem that we face over there. Uh, and there's engagement with organizations like ECOWAS, the Economic Council of Western African mm -hmm. States, uh, and, and perhaps uh, ILEA training for some of our counterparts over there. But there's much in the works, but a long, long way to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I believe you're all going to take care of this, but several members on this side wanted to submit questions, and so if we could have unanimous consent to allow them for five days. Uh, Does unanimous consent to allow all members to uh, submit uh, remarks and questions to the witnesses within the next five days? Do any of the witnesses have an objection to that? Or would the record reflect that they're all willing to do that, and uh, by unanimous consent, that'll be the case. Uh, just one last set of brief questions on that. Mr. Zubin, are you properly uh, staffed in terms of the Treasury? Does it have enough personnel in collaboration with your colleagues here and your own staff to address this at the level which you want to address it? I mean, we're uh, a much smaller outfit, obviously, than uh, some of my colleagues located here, and, and that's uh, as it should be. We're, we don't need to do the very difficult work of drug eradication. Uh, right. I'm assuming that you leverage them for some of the things that you need. Is that be a correct statement? I'm sorry? You're able to leverage their assistance for a lot of what you need? That's very, that's very accurate. Uh, right. And it's DEA's field investigators, the information that they're obtaining, the information that our intelligence colleagues are obtaining that then feeds and fuels our, our targeting efforts to apply sanctions. Okay. Do you find that like other aspects of this drug situation that when you shut off one avenue, there are still too many avenues left available, and those would be countries that don't cooperate with the United States, and what other impediments would we have? And I didn't hear the last few words. I'm Mostly sorry. the impediments that we have uh, for getting this right are some countries still just don't cooperate, and are there other impediments as well? I, I, I heartily agree that wherever you hit them, they then move to an, another uh, area, whether that's another means of transmitting money, uh, whether you're talking about moving from financial system to the gray market, 
uh, Casas de Cambios and, uh, and bulk cash. There's also, uh, as soon as we designate a company, we know that there's going to be efforts to circumvent sanctions, to create a, a new company, a new shell, a new front, and disguise the assets. And uh, we, th this is our bread and butter, is uh, not just designating a network and walking away from it, but then monitoring very closely to see what are springing up as the, the attempts at evasion and hammering them again. Uh, there, there's a cat and mouse aspect to it, which I think is common to all law enforcement efforts, but we just have to keep at it. I want to give each of you an opportunity, if anybody feels they wanted to contribute something but weren't giving that chance, uh, just give me some acknowledgement here, and I'll be happy to give you an opportunity to make a closing statement on that. Mr. Karolowski. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there was some discussion about uh, um, efforts to, to promote legalization. The administration is on the record a uh, hundred times over uh, that legalization uh, of drugs is not in the president's vocabulary, it is not in mine, and it's not anything being discussed. Uh, role models, uh, there is only one uh, anti-drug messaging system out there. Uh, the president requested $70 million for that, and, uh, and I think that's important. And then the, uh, Mr. Placido brought up the number of deaths in this country, the tragic number of deaths in this country that exceed gunshot wounds that are due to drugs. That has been spiked by prescription drugs, drugs coming right out of medicine cabinets and pharmaceutical uh, uh, places, uh, not necessarily drugs flowing into the country from other countries. Anybody else? Uh, Ambassador? Just to follow up on a, on a couple of points. On the, the issue that uh, Mr. Flake raised with re respect to West Africa, we're doing our best to get ahead of this problem. The President's request for uh, assistance to West Africa for institution building goes up sharply in this budget to from a, a relatively small base, but to $13.5 million. And while uh, it is dwarfed, if you will, by some of our other programs, there is a, an, a capacity take down from, from the governments involved that we have to pay attention to. We showering them with more and more resources may not be the best way. We're going to have to build and work with our partners, as Tony was mentioning, uh, both within our government and, and without. The second point I'd make is, uh, as, as Will was mentioning earlier, this is very much an every agency at the table operation. There's a role for AFRICOM here. There's a very big role for DEA. There's a role for institution building as well. And there's, there's a role for, for controlling finance. The, the second point to, to follow up I would make, uh, uh, there was a question raised earlier about whether we should uh, drop everything else we're doing and work just on Mexico. That's a very important challenge that we have, and the law of concentric circles certainly works. But we have an in incredible national interest in addressing the problems of Afghanistan in order for our colleagues in the military to succeed. And so while the heroin problem from Afghanistan affects largely its immediate neighbors, in particular Iran and the Central Asian countries, as well as Europe and the Russian Federation. We have an enormous interest in helping deal with that problem because if we don't, we're not going to succeed in any other way there at all. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add uh, briefly to clarify the record. It's been mentioned several times that hardly any of the heroin from Afghanistan comes to the United States. And, in point of fact, we run a, uh, a forensic chemistry program that identifies the source uh, geographically of, of the heroin that's seized in the United States. And there is a small percentage, about 4 percent of the heroin seized and analyzed by our DEA laboratories uh, has its origins in Southwest Asia, Afghanistan. Uh, but more importantly is that a, a large percentage of the heroin abused in Canada today uh, comes from Southwest Asia and Afghanistan. And so it, it would be a mistake to, to simply say that this is a European problem or a problem in Iran or Russia, other places, uh, which feel the bite of Afghan heroin more strongly today because uh, these networks that are smuggling into Canada could very easily move that heroin into the United States and undercut the market um, quickly. So it's, it's not something that we can take our eye off the ball on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me leave this closing question with you. When we look at a, a range of uh, drugs that cause problems for people, either result in deaths or addiction or uh, health problems, also with line, alcohol is way up there. In fact, it's over, way over some of the drugs that we've talked about here today. So how do we reconcile that, that, that alcohol is way up there? We spend very little attention on that. Uh, marijuana, for instance, is way down there. 
and we spend an incredible amount of attention on that. Are we prioritizing uh, any of our efforts on that, or are we taking that into account at all? Mr. Klausky, I'll, I'll let you do that one. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, the issue of underage drinking has been in all of the uh, past national drug control strategies, uh, a discussion about it. I think it's well recognized. It isn't exactly in my portfolio, uh, but we're certainly able to address it and talk about it because we also see that combination of alcohol and other types of drugs, and, uh, and uh, your points are, are well taken. Sir, I, I would just add that um, our guidance from the Department of Justice and from ONDCP, for that matter, on uh, the prioritization of these drug threats is, is crystal clear. Uh, and while there's been much news uh, about law enforcement operations targeting medical marijuana, pain clinics, and the like, uh, I can tell you that it's a, uh, it's a minuscule part of DEA's overall effort that is spent on those kinds of operations and that when we do get engaged in those, uh, it is because the, the people engaged in that activity are violating both state and federal law and we're doing it uh, with, the, with the help and at the request of state governments. So you, you want to tell me, Mr. Placido, that every time the federal DEA goes into a state that has legalized medical marijuana and uh, makes a bust or an arrest in there, it gets involved in that, you've been requested to go in by the state? We're working in, c in conjunction with the state, that's right. You're working in conjunction with have been requested to go in by them, or is it an initiative of the federal it, government? It depends, it depends on at what level you're talking about uh, the request. I mean, there's not a formal request coming from the governor's office, uh, but, but oftentimes working with local, municipal, and county authorities who've requested assistance. Because I've read quite a bit lately, uh, there seems to be some discontent with the fact that, uh, you know, the policy was that, you know, would people legalize for medical use in different states that the federal government would basically allow that policy to be implemented, but the DEA seems to be, according to these accounts, a bit of a rogue agency off of there and, and just going off and doing it anyway. Uh, I would assert that that's not the case, sir, and we'd be glad to provide you a briefing at a later time if you'd like. I'd, I'd like that if you would. I just want to follow up on that. Mr. Karlowski? Uh, Mr. Chairman, also the, uh, the guidelines from the Attorney General's office to the United States Attorney and those uh, attorneys in those states with medical marijuana, there is a, a sentence that uh, says that they should listen to the concerns voiced by uh, local law enforcement and prosecutors to be receptive to that issue. Right. I understand that to be the case, but what we're reading about is that there, there aren't any complaints on that side and they're going in anyway, despite local uh, considerations otherwise. So I do want to clarify that and I would like at least a staff briefing on that so that we can uh, sort of clarify that issue on that. I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here today for your uh, testimony and expertise. We'll do those follow-up questions and I know that the members were not leaving because of disinterest, but there's a, um, a ceremony for Mr. Uh, Murtha who passed away right now and it's drawn a lot of uh, members away. So thank you again. This meeting is adjourned. It works on my worst symptoms, so I'm ready by the time we get to the first hole. And that's good, because the competition's steep today. New Zyrtec liquid gels work fast, so I can love the air. I mean, it is not that big a town. Now, you were out there when they found the van. Why didn't you ask some questions out there? Bubba was with you. Why didn't you? Chief, you know what the problem oh, is. Oh, yeah? What is the problem? Those guys are black. And odds are they're hiding out in the bottom somewhere. Now, what kind of cooperation do you expect us to get down there? Now, if Mr. Tibbs was covering that area... Oh, come on. Chief, just a minute. Let me tell you.